Today, I want to talk to you about avoiding toxins in your environment because this is so important for your children's health. Unfortunately, we live in a quite polluted world, indoors and outdoors. And that can get quite overwhelming, that thought, and it can be depressing. But I want to tell you today how you can reduce the exposure of these toxins to your children and help them live healthier lives. So why do we need to talk about toxins? Why are they bad? You know, I'm going to talk about the effect on health and development in children when they're exposed to toxins. I'm going to talk about where these toxins are and which ones are particularly dangerous and how to avoid them. I'll give you a little household tour through your home so you can see what in which room, what to pay attention to and what um, foods to avoid and so on. So I hope I will give you some really practical tips today that you can implement right away. So we do live in a toxic world, not a good thing. The air indoors, outdoors is polluted with particles and pesticides and all kinds of toxins, chemicals. There are about 84,000 chemical chemicals used in household items, and only 200 have been tested by the FDA. So only five are regulated. So you can see that um, we are not doing the right thing by our children, um, making sure that anything that's produced in large numbers is safe. The toxins are found in our water, in our food, um, everywhere. So, but, you know, we can do something about it, keep that in mind. So there is this toxicity iceberg, you know, the, um, there are 12 chemicals that are known to be toxic to human development. And I will go through those with you in a minute. And then there are 214 that have been tested and known to be neurotoxic for adults. So think Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, those kind of things. And a thousand chemicals that are known to be toxic in animal experiments. And then there are 84,000 that are used that haven't been tested. And seven new ones are being approved every single day. So you can see that we're really polluting our world without knowing what the effect is of these chemicals, especially on developing children and their brains. So why are environmental toxins particularly toxic for children? So first of all, children's de detoxification organs are immature. Their liver, their kidneys, they don't sweat as much. So the ways that we excrete toxins don't work as well for children. And then they have greater exposure per body weight. So when you think about how much you eat and how much your child eats and div divide that by the kilograms of body weight, they eat a lot more. So if they eat something that has, let's say, pesticides in it, they get a lot more pesticides per kilogram of body weight into their body. They drink more water, they breathe more air. Um, if you put creams on them, they have a bigger body surface. So greater exposure and not as good at excreting. Then they have that hand to mouth behavior, you know, where anything that <laughs> they touch the ground, they're close to the ground, and then they put their hands to their mouth. So they are also going to ingest more toxin that way. The other really important thing is that their organs and their brains are growing so incredibly rapidly in the first few years. So whatever toxins are going into their body are going to affect that more, that organ or that brain, because they are developing and creating many more new cells. And a lot of the chemicals we're exposed to are hormone disruptors. So they can disrupt the thyroid function and other hormones in our body that are really, really important for brain development and general development. So you can see that children are particularly susceptible. And whatever they're exposed to as children, will stay with them lifelong. So, you know, if a child is exposed to say lead in their first year, that effect will stay with them until they die. So we really, really have a great responsibility to avoid toxins. First of all, I wanna talk about air pollution. 93% of the world's children under the age of 15 breathe dangerously polluted air. So indoor air is actually often worse than outdoor air. 
we can't do that much about the outdoor air. We can move, you can move to where those 7% of children live who are breathing clean air, but that's going to be difficult for most people. But indoor air, you have more control over. So, you know, things like smoking, obviously terrible. You should stop that right away. Fireplaces, open fireplaces, um, pollute the air with um, small particles that go into the lungs of the children and affect them, can of course asthma, breathing problems, but also um, volatile organic um, compounds in paint, for example, and carpets, you know, contain a lot of chemicals and mold indoors is particularly bad. And then also your garage. So if you park your car in your garage that is right next to your living room, the gases that your car emits while it is cooling down are actually quite toxic and they don't stop at the door. They come through um, into your living room and affect your health and your child's health. So we can measure particulate matter, the PM 2.5, the PM 10, you know, anyone who has been in fires um, these last seasons um, has, you know, known about the P, um, PM95 masks that filter everything out that is smaller than five micro something. <laughs> but um, we also have other gases in the air like ozone and nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide and, you know, um, so there is um, a lot of different gases out there. Mixed traffic related air pollution is, affects children's brains. The closer a child lives to a busy highway, um, the more likely they are to have some kind of developmental delay or ADHD. So um, apart from the asthma and the lower respiratory infections and inflammation, it does affect the brain as well. And contributes to chronic disease later in life. So we really need to work politically on the outdoor air, you know, and get um, more public transport and more bicycles and less car driving and less coal burning power plants. But indoor air, we can control ourselves. And, you know, one of the things you may have to do after you've gotten rid of your fireplace and you stopped smoking and you got rid of the toxic um, paints and carpets and so on is get a room air purifier because that is like a HEPA filter for the air. It sucks out the chemicals out of the air and breathes out fresh air. So that's a, a really, really handy thing to have in your house. So moving on to environmental toxins, which are chemicals, pesticides, and also EMF. Let's talk about neurotoxins that affect children's brain development. There are two wonderful researchers in America, Phil Landrigan and Phil Grandjean, and they have studied um, or looked at the research that's out there about developmental neurotoxins and have come up with these, this list here. And I'm gonna talk of, about a few of those. So mercury is mostly found in fish. So you can get mercury exposure from other places, but most children who have high mercury levels get it from fish. Lead, is usually found in old lead paint from nine, before 1975. So outdoor um, paint on houses, sheds, windows, decks. And the lead paint actually crumbles down, becomes dust and settles on the ground. And then young children who are crawling on the ground get it on their hand and put it in their mouth. So there is a lot of research on lead toxicity, how it affects brain development, and that really the only safe level of lead in the blood is zero. Even the tiniest amount of lead in the blood reduces the IQ of the child a little bit. So if we want the best for our children, we should get rid of lead. Arsenic, where do we get arsenic from? The highest exposure right now is from rice, from eating rice. And I have an article on my blog about how to prepare rice to reduce the arsenic exposure. So by actually soaking it, just like you would soak legumes, throwing out the water, and then cooking it like pasta in a lot of water and, rinse it and rinsing it at the end. So that can reduce um, arsenic exposure. Then the PBDEs are the flame retardants and furniture. 
a lot of furniture stores um, are now offering flame retardant free furniture and that's what you should look for because when you sit on that sofa that has been impregnated with flame retardants you actually absorb that through your skin not a good thing they, those are hormone disruptors and um of course, ethanol, alcohol, you know, we should not expose our children to alcohol, either in utero, the only safe level of drinking in the pregnancy is none. So please tell your friends. And um, there is a lot of research that I discussed with my teenage boys all the time about the negative effects of alcohol. The latest study showed that you have, even if you just drink once a week, a 20% increased risk of brain shrinkage. So we don't want that. <laughs> I would like to talk to you about pesticides because there is a lot of interest in pesticides exposure and the effect on development. The, the closer a woman lives during her pregnancy to a field that is sprayed with organophosphate pesticides, the higher the risk that that child in her inside will develop autism, ADHD, or developmental problems. So it's um, not good for the brain. And the biggest effect is before birth. It's still not great after birth, but especially we need to pr protect our pregnant women. How do these organophosphates pesticides harm the brain? They disrupt the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which is critical for brain development and for short-term memory and attention. So if you have a child with ADHD, think, let's get rid of the pesticide spray, the fly spray in the house. These are not good for children's brains. They also de disrupt the DNA replication. So making new DNA is needed to make new cells, new brain cells. And children are more vulnerable. We've talked about a lot of cause reasons for that, but also they have lower levels of the enzyme acetylcholinesterase that actually breaks down these toxins. So if you have a fly spray in your house, get rid of it. It has, the, the fly sprays affect the, um, the pests, the insects nervous system, but we actually have exactly the same nervous system. It's just that we're much bigger, but it accumulates in our fatty tissues. So it's not a good thing for the children's brains. Another interesting thing is um, when you look at the gut under the microscope, when the gut has been exposed to glyphosate, which is Roundup, which we have in a lot of the foods we eat, you can see that the tight junctions between the cells are destroyed and you get what's called increased permeability in the gut or leaky gut. And then things that are not fully digested and shouldn't go through from the gut into the bloodstream can go through and increase the risk of developing allergies, for example. Now, just in the last few weeks, I've had several patients with really high lead levels. And the most important thing when you have um, a child with lead is first of all, to find out. So in America where I did my pediatric training 25 years ago, every single child was tested for lead in the first year because it is such a terrible toxin. And if you know it's there, then you can look for the source and eliminate it. But if you don't know that it's there, you won't do anything. So I think it's something to have a really high index of suspicion for in any child with a developmental delay, in any child with hyperactivity, um, behavior issues. And one of the things I look at is, you know, when kids lift their, look at their fingers, often their fingertips are very, very pink when they have lead poisoning. So that may be a clue. And if your child has that, maybe get your GP to check the lead. So where does the lead come from? It's usually from the old paint from before 1975. It has been banned, but it is still in the paint of some cheap toys brought in from overseas. There have been recalls for like Thomas the Tank Engine, little engines that were not cheap, <laughs> but were painted with lead paint. Um, you can also have lead in your water. So um, it can be, you know, if you have a really old house, you can have lead soldering, um, but sometimes it's just on the water. If you live near a mining town, 
um, where they're mining for, may not be mining for lead, they may be mining for zinc or for something else, but often those same mines contain lead. And um, what does the lead do? It does affect concentration, learning, memory, IQ. Um, the typical child with lead poisoning, it gets quite aggressive and there's, you know, in, in cities, they've done this research over many years where they looked at when lead was taken out of petrol. That used to be a big part of the exposure, but is no longer. We now have lead-free petrol. But any country or any city where they decided to take lead out, 20, about 15, 20 years later, they had a drop in crime. So interesting. Yeah, so. But once again, there is no safe level. So you really want to get it down to zero. The, the blood tests give you a normal range, normal, <laughs> but um, every few years, those normal levels are cut in half. So many years ago, a level of 10 was the acceptable level, but since we've learned more about the toxic effects of lead, even at low levels, now it's five. And I am sure in a few years, it will be 2.5. And eventually, everybody will agree that it should be zero. So the main thing, if there is lead, is to eliminate the source. You have to find it. You can get a lead testing kit from your hardware store and test toys or crockery, paint. Um, those are the most common um, sources. Uh, sometimes you have to go further and maybe get a building biologist or the public health department to come and see what else you can find. In the latest case I found, it was an old homemade doll's house that was painted with lead paint. So look at old toys. Now I want to move on to mercury. Mercury um, is another quite common toxicity I find in children with behavior issues. I've had quite a few kids who were very hyperactive and turned out to have very high mercury levels from eating fish or fish soup, which concentrates it even more. And if you look at this list here of mercury poisoning symptoms and ADHD symptoms, you see that they overlap quite a bit. So when I see a child with these symptoms, I always check for mercury. And quite often I find that the mercury level is elevated. Where does it come from? Mostly from eating fish. Now fish, live in the ocean. The ocean is contaminated with all kinds of toxins, including mercury, but it's really only a marker for a lot of other toxins like DDT and PCBs. A lot of chemicals that have long been banned, but they stay in the ocean because they don't break down very fast. With mercury, it increases as you go up the food chain. So if you eat algae, which is kind of the first food for the tiny little animals in the ocean, they have very small amounts of mercury. But as you go up, the bigger the fish, so the bigger fish eat the smaller fish, and then the even bigger fish eat the bigger fish. And so you go up to the biggest fish, those have the highest concentration of mercury. So you should avoid eating things like swordfish, bluefins, tuna, Spanish mackerel, of course, shark, you know, or dolphin. I hope nobody eats dolphin. But those are the animals that have very, very high mercury levels. So if you have high mercury levels and you're eating fish, you should go for tiny fish. So I always recommend sardines if you're going to eat fish. But even better, I mean, most people eat the fish to get omega-3 fatty acids, which are good for the brain, but you can get them from algae. Go straight to the source. Then people say, what about salmon? Isn't salmon healthy? And salmon used to be healthy, but nowadays more than 90% of the world salmon is grown in farms and fish farms. And that is a very different raising or growing for the salmon than in nature. So salmon have this beautiful orange pink color and that comes usually from eating krill. But in the farms, they don't eat krill. They get some horrible ground up chicken feed to eat. And that does not contain that pink color of krill. So the fish farmers add orange color, artificial color, which obviously is not a healthy thing. Then also because the fish are all so close together in these huge farms, the sea lice get attracted and attack the fish. So the farmers have to add pesticides to get rid of the sea lice. So 
there are significantly higher levels of 13 toxins in farmed salmon. And I would recommend not eating salmon anymore unless you can get it from a um, from an ocean source, but you know oceans are also almost empty of fish, so it may be better to get your omega three from algae. So some people say, are we overreacting? You know, BPA, for example, bisphenol A in plastic. There are many studies looking into the toxicity of bisphenol A, and the studies have now led to a ban of BPA, for example, in baby bottles. Now, if you look at the studies, the studies, you have to really look at who's paying for them. So the studies paid for by companies that have something to do with producing plastics, 90% of those studies say there is no danger in BPA. But if you look at the independent studies done at universities or um, done by governments without funding from the companies that have an interest in BPA, 100% of those studies show that it is toxic to children's brains and development, and it's a hormone disruptor, and that we should really avoid it. So it's become um, recommended not to use in baby bottles and a lot of other things. Now, my point for that is we've done that for BPA. So what is used in baby bottles now? They use something called BPS, bisphenol S. And it has exactly the same effect. It's just that we haven't done the studies yet to show that it's just as toxic. So I would recommend avoiding plastic altogether. Get glass bottles or stainless steel. Avoid the plastic because it's not good for your children's brains. Mold is another toxic exposure. Mold is actually my enemy number one. <laughs> I really don't like mold. I see a lot of children who have asthma or breathing problems who live in moldy um, houses or apartments or play in areas that are moldy. It's very, very toxic for the immune system and it can also affect the brain. So there is um, a group of people um, who are very susceptible genetically to the toxicity of mold. So some people can be in a moldy room and really not feel that much, but at least 25% of the population are very sensitive to mold. And they can actually get very tired from it or irritable or aggressive. So I have seen children in my clinic who came with behavior issues and, and tiredness, and it turned out that they had black mold in their house and nobody had thought so much about it, but you need to get rid of it and you can't do it by yourself. So you really need a professional to help you with that because it is so toxic. You should actually not go into that room, but also remember that the mold travels. It doesn't, you know, the spores are in the air even if you don't see them. Also check your mattresses. You know, I've had patients who were sleeping on a mattress and when they turned it over, it had black mold underneath it and just getting rid of that mattress solved all the sleeping problems. So be a detective in your home and look for the sources of any kind of exposure. Now EMF, another one. You know, when my children were little, there were no cell phones. I'm actually really grateful for that. And nowadays I see two-year-olds already playing on the phone very expertly, but it's not good for their brains. And apart from the screen time and all that, the EMF itself, we don't really have enough research to say that it is safe. It is probably not safe for children's brains. So the, the producers of cell phones say, never put the phone on a child's head. And I would say, always put the phone on airplane mode or your iPad, if you give it to a child, you know, put it on airplane mode, put it on speakerphone if you want to talk, even for yourself. The, the further away the phone is from your head, the less toxic it will be. Now, looking at skincare, something completely different. You may have not thought about that things that you put on your skin, on your face, on your shampoo, all of those things actually get absorbed into your body. It only takes 26 seconds for the chemicals in your personal care products to enter your bloodstream. So you really want to make sure that whatever you put on your child's skin is healthy. 
I actually would like to be to have only things on my skin that I could eat. You know, it's it's not quite that easy, but you can get um, healthy products. There's a very nice database called ewg.org, the Healthy Skin Database um, Environmental Working Group, and I'd urge you to have a look at it and find products that do not contain these toxins. So for example, propylene glycol is in a lot of skin conditioners and um, emollients, and it actually irritates the skin barrier and breaks it down. And the skin barrier, once it's broken down, you get more eczema, you also get, uh, um, get more dry skin, you get more itchiness, you can get all kinds of rashes, so not good. Um, we don't want sodium lauryl sulfate. SLS, as LES. So those are the foaming agents that are not healthy. They can irritate the eyes, the lungs, the skin, but they're also um, potentially contaminated with carcinogens. So you can find products without these. So have a look at it and um, really look. Um, sorry, I'll go with, have a look at it. So check the products you buy, read the labels and make sure that they only contain safe ingredients. I'm a big proponent of the precautionary principle, which is the opposite of what we're doing right now. Right now we're producing 84,000 chemicals and we don't know whether they're toxic or not. And the burden of proof is with us. We people have to prove that something is bad for us. It, the precautionary principle says, companies that want to produce chemicals have to prove that they're safe, or we should just always, you know, be more careful, <laughs> be cautious. So one of my favorite um, organizations is EWG, Environmental Working Group, and they have, um, as I said already, the, the Healthy Skin Database. They have, for example, lists of healthy sunscreen that don't contain any chemicals. The only chemical that I would allow in a sunscreen is zinc oxide, okay? So if you're looking for a good sunscreen, get one that has only zinc oxide as an active ingredient. For food, EWG has this wonderful clean 15 and dirty dozen list that is updated every year. And they'll give you the clean 15 vegetables and fruit that you don't necessarily have to buy organic because usually they have a thick peel like a watermelon or an avocado. So the pesticides don't get into the food as much. And then the dirty dozen are the fruits and vegetables you should never buy unless they're organic because they're so highly contaminated. And the top is always berries. So I buy my berries um, organic in the frozen section because they're always fresh. In the summer we get fre really fresh, <laughs> but year round you can get them in the frozen section. And um, because they're frozen right at the, um, at the place where they're harvested, they're actually contain all the antioxidants and, and phytonutrients. So you get all the goodness. What are some thim simple things to reduce air pollution in your house? Number one, open your windows. So in Germany, where I'm from, when you rent an apartment, you actually have to sign in the contract that you're going to open the windows every day for 15 minutes, rain or shine, because you want that fresh air going through and avoid mold. Um, but you're also, you know, cleaning the air from um, the VOCs and the small particles that may be emitted. Don't smoke in the house. I mean, if you're doing just one thing, if you smoke, please quit. Get the patches, call the quit line. Um, many people have done it. It's possible. And it's terrible for your children to be exposed to smoke. So that alone will increase their risk of ADHD if you smoke. Don't get a fireplace. And most places, if you build a new place now or renovate, you're not allowed to put an open fireplace anymore because the pollution is so high from it, not just indoors, but also outdoors. So just don't have a fireplace unless it's completely enclosed. Don't use air fresheners. So all the air fresheners and even the scented candles, they all contain chemicals that are not healthy and have hormone disruptors in them. Don't use insect sprays. I think I have made that clear. And let your car cool outside. 
So if you need to let it cool down, don't go straight into the garage, let it cool outside on the street and then drive it into your garage because all those chemicals that are emitted while it's cooling down are very toxic. And use a room air purifier. Now is a good time to buy one. Um, you know, once the, the very polluted season starts again, hopefully not, but if it does, they will all be sold out. <laughs> What are some other simple things you can do to reduce toxins? Take your shoes off when you come into the house. Your shoes have been in places outdoors um, where they have sprayed pesticides maybe, um, where you've stepped into dog poo. There's all kinds of dirt outside that you don't want to bring into the house, especially if you have young children who are playing on the ground. Um, Invest in a healthy bed and bedding. Yeah, check your child's mattress and your own. Make sure it's clean. You know, I'm, I use latex mattress for myself and I love it. Dust mites don't grow in latex, so that's a big advantage as well if anyone has a dust mite allergy, which is becoming very, very common. And get healthy bedding. Just remember your children spend half their life in their bed. So you wanna make sure it's a healthy spot where they're not exposed to pesticides, for example, from the, the, the sheets, you don't want, if you can, organic or at least 100% cotton, wash it a few times before you use it if it's not organic and make sure the mattress doesn't emit fumes. You know, there are, um, a lot of um, baby mattresses have been actually taken off the market because they were emitting so many fumes. So make sure you get a healthy mattress. Um, and you'll sleep better and your children too. Use non-toxic cleaning products and detergents. Um, very, very easy. I find that the easiest, you know, everybody uses some kind of cleaning product. It's so easy to just replace it with one from a company that is non-toxic. Um, I like, for example, EcoStore or Abode, but there are other companies out there. Just read the label, make sure it's not just greenwashing, <laughs> that is actually truly non-toxic, but it's very easy. Also the detergents, I see a lot of children who have um, eczema respond really well to changing detergent that doesn't contain any chemicals, so really important. Use non-toxic personal care products. I talked about that. It only takes 20 seconds, 26 seconds to be absor absorbed from the skin into your bloodstream and reduce plastic. Replace it with stainless steel, with wood, with glass, with bamboo. So there are many products out there that are um, non-plastic and reusable. And for toys, rather than buying quantity, go for quality, buy less, but get good quality toys that are not going to be painted with lead and are not plastic with BPA. So um, kids actually don't need that many toys. You know, they're, they're more creative if they have less toys and spend more time in nature. If you've listened to my other lecture on lifestyle, that's really much more important than the toys. So there are lots of healthy alternatives available at your local supermarket, online, you know, just look for, for things that are not plastic and not chemicals and don't contain lead. I'm just gonna take you on a short household tour from room to room so that you can think about in your brain, you know, put your detective hat on and think of what can I, where would be toxins in this room and what do I do about it? So in the kitchen, if you look under the sink, it's more, mainly the cleaning products the detergent, but it's also the water. So for water, if you are concerned about the quality of water, get a water filter. I myself have a reverse osmosis water filter that works really, really well. It's installed under the sink, but you can also get ones that are on top of the sink if you're going to move. And um, they take out all the impurities and um, remineralize the water. So you get healthy drinking water. I use that water for drinking and cooking. Then your food, you wanna get ideally mostly organic, non-processed, no additives, of course. Um, get rid of the insect sprays. And if you're going to do any painting or renovation, just make sure that you use low VOC paint. In the kitchen, you also have water bottles for your children, so make sure they're stainless steel. Um, if they're old enough not to throw them on the ground, you can use glass. 
and for food containers, leftovers use stainless steel or glass or bamboo. Um, there's so many beautiful eco-friendly products now available for the kitchen. Just hop online and have a look. In the bathroom, again, you want clean um, cleaning products. You want um, healthy personal care products. You whatever you put in the bath, you know, if your, if your child has a bath, make sure that that is healthy. I actually recommend not much. Children really don't need a lot of personal care products, you know, a tiny bit of soap where they're really dirty. Um, they should not need um, bubble baths. That's usually quite unhealthy and irritating to the skin, especially kids who have dry and itchy skin, avoid the bubble bath. And you can add a little bit of Epsom salts instead, which will help them sleep better. Then the bedroom, in the bedroom, look at the mattress, make sure it's clean, get a latex mattress if you can, if you're going to replace it anyway. Make sure the bedding is cotton or bamboo or something else that doesn't irritate the skin, organic if possible, or washed a few times. Um, then the clothes, you know, avoid flame retardants. So don't buy clothes that say low fire danger because they contain flame retardants. So especially pajamas, you know, much better to get um, plain cotton pajamas. And don't avoid, and don't use chemicals in the bath in the bedroom. So don't use fly sprays, um, scented candles, those kind of things. They are unnecessary and they expose your children to chemicals. Then in the living room, let's look at the furniture. Is there flame retardants in the couch? Um, what are the paints? Do we have candles with scents? So all of those things can be um, avoided. If you buy new furniture, maybe look at not using MDF or at least use the MDF that has the highest eco standard. So it's not uh, made with very toxic glues. And then last but not least, the garden, pesticides. I have so many friends and families who have changed their gardening practices and no longer use any pesticides and maybe even let the, the lawn grow and make it become a um, wildflower meadow rather than a perfectly cut lawn. And soil. So contaminated soil, depending on what the area was used to in the past. So for example, if it was a farm, there may be pesticides in the soil. If it was a gardening um, area or a mining area, whatever, you wanna know that there's no lead in the soil. And there's actually a free lead testing for soil um, available. And I'll put that in the study notes um, where you can get that. I'd recommend that, especially if your child has high lead levels. Make sure the soil is clean. Plants are a wonderful way of reducing toxins in the, in the house. So they absorb toxins. Here you have a list of the best air cleaning house plants like the rubber plant and the snake plant. I have those all over my house. But the truth is that all plants do that. It's just that you know when they first um, tested plants for absorbing toxins, it was done um, in, not by NASA. So they were thinking we're taking plants on our mission to the moon or Mars, which plants should we take? So they, plant, they tested a few plants and they, they did it, but they all do. <laughs> so you can choose your favorite plants, have them around the house and they will absorb some of the toxins in the indoor air. And they look beautiful. So remember, there are toxins everywhere, we can't get away from them, but we can reduce the exposure to our children. And it's very important for their development and for their health. Use non-toxic cleaning products. It's easy enough to just replace those and detergents and body care products. Open the windows every day for some draft so that you clean the air inside. Take off your shoes when you come inside the house to avoid bringing in dirt. Avoid pesticides because they actually have the same neurotoxic effects on our children's brains as they do on the neurological system of the pests, except that our children are much bigger, so the effect is smaller, but still bad. <laughs> Use plants around the house 
and get healthy bedding because that's where you, your children spend half their life. I have um, some study notes for you with um, checklists of things you can do in each room of your house and in general to reduce exposure, what to replace, have a look at that. And I hope you enjoy going through your environment and reducing the exposure to toxins to your children. And I am sure that this will help them be healthier and happier. And um, I cannot tell you how important it is to be aware of these toxins and get rid of the source because I have seen so many children with symptoms of, for example, ADHD or learning problems who once we found that there was a toxin and eliminated it, the toxin, they did much, much better. Okay, thank you so much for listening and please have a look at the study notes.